Well, there's Noah's couch. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from unseated Ramatish Ohlone land from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the fall season. Tonight, we are delighted to be celebrating two amazing poets and the launch of Benjamin Gucciardi's new poetry collection titled West Portal, published by the University of Utah Press. It's the winner of the 2020 Aga Shahid Ali Poetry Prize. West Portal is the name of a neighborhood in San Francisco where Benjamin grew up. It is also one of the names of the pillars of Heracles and uh, also the entryway of the afterworld. Most appropriate factoids to know when embarking upon reading this remarkable collection of poems. Benjamin Gucciardi is the author of the chapbook Ask My Sister's Ghost. His poems have appeared in Agni, Alaska Quarterly Review, Best New Poets, Harvard Review, Ryan Magazine, Southern Indiana Review, as well as other journals. He has received numerous honors for his work. These include Booth's Prize for Unexpected Literature, the Milton Kessler Memorial Prize for Harper Pollatt, and the Trifecta Poetry Prize from Iron Horse Literary Review, and a Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Prize, as well as awards and fellowships from Sewanee Writers Conference, the Gentle Foundation, Playa, and Artsmith. He works with refugee and immigrant youth in Oakland, uh, through Soccer Without Borders, uh, an organization that he founded in 2006. So joining him tonight is Eduardo C. Corral. His debut collection of poetry, Slow Lightning, won the Yale Younger Poets Prize, making him the first Latino recipient of the award. His uh, second poetry collection is titled Guillotine. Eduardo C. Corral has received numerous honors and awards for his work, including the Discovery um, Nation Award, the J. Howard and Barbara M. J. Wood Prize, and a Wider's Writing Award and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Benjamin Bucciardi and Eduardo C. Corral. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Uh, ben, thank you for inviting me to share uh, this celebratory night with you, uh, a book launch for your debut. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor to be here. It's a magnificent debut. Uh, it's a book I'm teaching this fall to my graduates. So uh, I'm looking forward to those conversations. And uh, everybody, here it is, West Portal. Please support a poet, support our uh, young poets by picking up a copy at City Lights. I'm going to begin by reading uh, two newer drafts uh, and then some stuff from Guillotine. This first uh, newer draft is titled uh, Sonnet. All water flows toward loneliness. Loneliness is a black eye, a gleaming pit. We have yet to split loneliness like an atom. Loneliness arrives on a leash of scorpions. Inside my skull, loneliness opens like a parachute. It's illegal to chain loneliness to a fence. Flickers tunnel through loneliness to build nest. I sprinkle a spoon of sugar over loneliness. In some languages, Loneliness is imperfect. Velvet antlers crown the bald head of loneliness. Like rough trade, loneliness won't kiss you. Loneliness is crouched in a tree, naked, afraid. In the dark, loneliness ripens too quickly. Beneath the roof of loneliness, my blood drifts. to the poet who advised me to stop writing about the border. I just hope this poet is not in the audience tonight. I sleep best in cities bisected by water. In Mexico, a blue-eyed poet laughed when I spoke Spanish. Saguaros in Arizona 
have more rights than the undocumented. You need a permit to uproot one. My mother is my favorite immigrant. After her, the sonnet. Fuck you. I'm gonna read a handful of poems from uh, Guillotine, which I really read it. So let's see how I, they sound in the air tonight. Did I just quote Phil Collins? Yes, <laughs> I did. I'm a child of the 80s. This, a lot of the poems from the second book are about unrequited love, what happens to the lyric speaker, AKA me, and when they fall for somebody who can return that desire, that lust, that love. How do you navigate with that weight, that presence, that absence on your shoulders? This water, this poem is titled Black Water. I spit his name out and four wolves appear. Black, eyes silvery, ears skinned and tense. They thrash their tails twice, then rush toward me, a dark pouring. I stagger back, raise my arms. I'd watch him lather his throat once a week for a year. An oval mirror held him and doubled his gestures, his hands quick, odic. The wolves now closer, close. Their stench arrives first, decaying meat, feces, an eye-watering stink that severs me from hunger. The wolves crash into me, furious paws, teeth hot and notched, manes teeming with dirt. Briefly, I'm fording black water. Briefly, I forget his face. Then they vanish. I spin around, nothing but sand and sky. Even the scent of clay is gone. I tremble and tremble, raw my limbs. Then I hear the mirror in a room miles away, furred with frost and lust, it howls. A few years ago, I spent a, a couple of weeks in uh, Andalusia, uh, Spain, uh, in Granada. And Granada uh, was Lorca's familial home. And uh, there's a park named after him. And it, in the park, there is his family home. And you could visit it and see his desk where he wrote. And I spent maybe 10 days in Granada. And every day I went to the park and sat for at least an hour in the park next to his house hoping to be visited by Lorca's spirit, to be touched by Lorca's presence. I never sensed him in the air, uh, but these words, these, these words did arrive. So maybe he gave me a different kind of gift than I was expecting at the end of the day. This poem is a short little poem that's called response, a line and a small, and then I retort to the line. Lines written at Federico Garcia Lorca, Park. In the cage of my thumbprint, I keep my third wish. Acoustic winter. Rain undresses music. Rain undresses his voice. Arrow and minaret. Beneath my palm, the wiry fur of lust. Open, body, open. A wound is a self-reporting instrument, silver filigree. I sleep with his face under my tongue, scab on water. To a straight man. All zodiac, all radar, your voice. I carried it across the Atlantic to, Bar to Barcelona. I photographed cathedrals, cacti, mosaic salamanders. I even photographed my lust. Always your voice skimming her skin. Mattress springs so noisy, so bird-like, you filled her room with cages. Camera bright in my pocket, map unfolding in my mind. I explored a park leaves notched and enormous. 
graffiti boulders, then three men, tall and clean, closed in. They broke open my body with their fists. Insufferable, your red wool cap. Insufferable, the way you walked away from me. Come back, please. The buttons on your jacket, on your jacket are finches. I wanted to yell as you vanished into a hotel to drink with your friends. There was nothing more you could do. After my attackers left, before I got up, I touched my face almost tenderly. I'm gonna read two more poems. Uh, this poem was titled Postmortem. Um, the first line is, is, a, is a question and the response, the answer is a, a, a Nahuatl riddle or a metaphor or saying. Uh, Nahuatl, the Mexica, the Aztec uh, uh, from central Mexico. Postmortem, how did you meet? He stepped on my face. He stepped on my teeth. Was it love or lust? Can a hummingbird see that much? What happened when he touched you? The world spilled out. Did you, do you recall his eyes, a cup and a bow, and his voice? Possibly a mouse drank it. How did he make you feel? I am a fruitless tree. You are a fruitless tree. How did you cope by nibbling away? How do you remember him? I make a smudge. This last poem is a persona poem. The speaker is a Mexican American border patrol agent working the train of Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, and um, Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, and Tucson, Arizona, the Sonoran Desert, where I was born and raised. He's a man in his late 40s, uh, sitting in his Jeep thinking. Border patrol agent. Summer is a puta. I park beneath branches, crank up the AC in the Jeep. I hate the rearview mirror. It makes me look like my father, chased and singed. Last week, beneath the sky, Walmart blue, in a clearing full of bottles, sneakers, teepee rows, I found a body, legs gnawed to the knees, barbed wire tight around the throat. I remembered graffiti on a boulder. God is always hungry. Sometimes with binoculars, I watch wild horses hurry through the heat. Once a yearling stopped mid gallop, then collapsed into a bed of coals the rain could not extinguish. The radio is always crackling. Six wets sighted on infrared need a spick speaker stat. I only speak Spanish with my father. He often mistakes blue parakeets perched on the stove for gas flames. Last July, far from Tucson, I found a rape tree. Torn panties draped on branches, the tree a warning, a way for smugglers to claim terrain. Lightning climbs a hillside like a stilt walker. Rain strikes the windshield. I think of my wife asleep on her side, brass pressed together as if one were dreaming the other. Her womb empty, my dick useless. There are things I just can't tell her. Sometimes, only body parts remain. They're buried in baby caskets. Gracias. Thank you. Oh, almost knocked my uh, laptop away. Uh, thank you so much, Eduardo. That was uh, hard, hard for me to even get going here. That was took, took my breath away. So can we all just show some, show some big love for Eduardo? Um, <laughs> so nice to hear those new poems too. That was such a such a treat. Those are those are so gorgeous. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you all so so much for for coming. Um, such a treat just to to see you all here. Um, and and uh, I want to say thank you first to Peter and to City Lights for having us. 
Um, and of course, to say a huge thank you to Eduardo um, for, for agreeing to read and, and, and for sharing those beautiful poems. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Jules, who's here from Kampala. Um, I'm not sure, Jules, what time it is right now there, but it's so kind of you to stay up all the way, all the way so late. Um, and um, just truly, I, my only wish was that we could all be in the same space, but I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. Um, so I'm going to read from my book. Uh, West Portal. Um, and it was, um, yeah, just published last week. And I actually wanted to start reading the epigraph um, just to kind of give a little bit of a, a little bit of a sense of, of uh, what the book is exploring and, and the, de the definition of the title. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and read the epigraph. Um, West Portal, noun a hushed residential neighborhood in southwestern San Francisco at the base of Twin Peaks. The western terminus of an underground passage, the point where a train emerges into a city's western quadrant or the end of a tunnel dug beneath razor wire. An entryway into the afterworld, the westward movement of the soul after the body dies, following the path of the setting sun. Um, and I, I just wanted to start with that because I think Part of what I love so much about poetry is the way it helps you consider things from different angles and think about the ordinary interacting with the non-ordinary reality and how you can kind of look at the things that are common and, and see these other aspects. I think Eduardo's line about the the buttons are your buttons are goldfinches and just the ways that you know that the looking really um, allows you to see new things and and new understanding have to come to new understandings. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the first poem in the book, um, which is a poem called Type Two. Five times a day, I prick my finger and ask my blood about its failure. Out of its cage, it wants to discuss its better cages. How, before it was mine, it lived inside a python near Varanasi. The thrill of rushing when muscle snaps a rabbit's spine. How it wants to paint a self-portrait as the Ganges River. In the foreground, a woman in a yellow sari cleanses her son's limp body. His skin, the color of the river. The river, the color of her eyes. That's how holy I am, it says, as I turn the meter off. Trash the strip of a visitor trash the strip and choose a new tract to stick the insulin in. The python uncoils from its catch, slinks beneath a rusty harrow. The woman weaves marigolds in her son's wet hair, climbs beside him on the bamboo board. The current ferries them off the canvas, stretched over blue tile. Marigolds spill into my hamper crimson petals on the bathroom floor. That, that's my that's my cat Bodhi. He he may be making some other appearances. He he uh he, he loves it any occasion to, to, to visit with everyone. So um <clears throat> this next poem is called Advice for Paul Bears. To make the sound of your footsteps disappear requires practice. A cornfield in late autumn when the ground is brittle enough to repeat what it hears. Best if the six of you can go together at dusk. Find a barn owl. A corn crow will do. See how close you can get before the bird startles. Observe the interaction of air and wing. Before you handle the casket, borrow your mother's finest crystal vase. Carry it through the parking lot to the water park. Ride the slides. Let nothing shatter. The trick is for the coffin to appear to float, the weight of his failures superfluous. Let him be known as a saint for a few moments before he is forgotten.
<clears throat> so this next poem I'm gonna read is one of a series of poems that are sort of directly in conversation with my late sister, Becca. Um, and this poem is called, I Ask My Sister's Ghost to Take Me With Her. I ask my sister's ghost to take me with her, not because the reefs are bleaching, because I want to see how thin the veil is, to row behind her in the boat she came in, row all day into night, and where the river turns to delta, blade my oar to beach the dinghy on a bank of silt and cattail. Because I want to hide with her in midnight swaying, turn my ears from the throng of bullfrogs to the song she hums, listen to her stories of its blind composer, how he charmed wives at the royal parties in Dublin, his fingers sweeping each glissando, his eyes clouded over like a cod on ice. There is a symbol she taught me for a word that has no word, but I can never remember how to draw it, what tone to put in my throat to speak. The inked shape of that mutable mark hangs just beyond the last branch of my mind as she turns to leave. There is nothing I can say to convince her to take me. So I pluck the tongue from my mouth and lay it flat on a stone. When she bends to inspect the petal, it becomes a red door. It creaks as she opens it, walks into the unspoken without turning back. This next poem is called Hunting Chanterelles in the Oakland Hills. It is not only trauma which cleaves, the soul also fractures in joy. All month, I summon the shard of myself still kneeling in the sword fern, tracing the forked ridges of winter's first chanterelle. But it won't leave the scent, soil pinched with pepper, apricot, to return to the city where another piece of me mutters under the overpass, looking for a fix. Sometimes when I plead for my fragments to join, I hear my mother's voice calling her dead daughter home. Slow down, my friend insists, off trail and deep woods. They're easy to miss. Rain spills from my cap as I scour the chaparral, bending to buckeye roots, digging through dust. There, flesh worthy of the name, chanterelle. I remove the veil of mud as if it were lace. I splinter when my fingers slip the stem from loam. <clears throat> Thank you all for bearing with me there. <laughs> uh, this next poem is called The Rungs and this is a poem about holding space for young people, um, teachers who are familiar with circle processes will relate to this one. Um, the rungs. <clears throat> Only the person with the green dice should be talking, I remind the boys, holding up the oversized foam cubes. And the others should be listening, Kay says. And how should we listen? Con el corazón, M replies, thumping his chest with his closed fist. That's right, I say, with the heart. Who wants to start? The dice are passed around the circle and the boys gloss over the check-in question. When they reach B, who walked here unaccompanied from Honduras three months ago, he holds them like boulders. We straighten when his lip begins to quiver. It's not my place to tell you what he shared that day, but I can tell you how M put his hand on B's back and said, Mahe, desahogarte, 
which translates roughly to undrown yourself, though no English phrase so willingly accepts that everyone has drowned and that we can reverse that gasping, expel the fluids from our lungs. I sit quietly as the boys make with their bodies the rungs of a ladder and B climbs up from the current, sits in the sun for a few good minutes before he jumps back in. The dice finish the round and we are well over time. I resist the urge to speak about rafts, what it means to float. Good, I tell them, let's go back to class. After handshakes and side hugs, I'm left alone in the small room with a box of unopened tissues, two starburst wrappers on the ground. I'm still getting used to navigating uh, where, the, where the next poems are in the book. So just give me one second. I'm, I'm gonna read two more poems. Um, and then Eduardo and I will talk for a moment and we'll open up for questions. Um, so this poem is called The Last Bear in the Headlands. And it's a, it's a San Francisco poem. And it's a poem about young love and, and other things. The Last Bear in the Headlands. I cased the marina for three months until I declare the ship abandoned. It's perfect, I tell you. And since our rent had doubled, what choice do we have but to make it perfect? We seal the leaks and buff the rust. The empties left in the cabin make enough at the aluminum exchange for a few weeks worth of lentils. At evening, you paint the city's changing skyline in your muted palette, and I walk through the wetlands, bisected by the freeway. You never paint the golden gate, and I love you for it. Love the way you refuse what is commonly loved. Refuse even the word love. The egret's steps stir petrol rings, and I count the slick concentric ripples as if tallying ears on a slab of wood, noting the dry decades where the rings tighten, followed by thick bands of plenty, billows of fog, rain sheets filtering through roots which don't go deep but wide. Most days I go swimming before you wake, even though the bay is sick, the bull kelp bobs and the muscles lining the pier at low tide are the color of a bruise. And what is a bruise but the body fighting back? I crawl in the cot beside you, smelling of neoprene, the boat lulling in the hum of I-80. Your paintings hang on every inch of the cabin and through the circular window, the brown grasses of the headlands sway across the bay, a light ring etching the space between cloud and land. I want to wake you and tell you the hill is like the pelt of a bear, the rain its tongue, that the last bear in the headlands is the headlands itself. But I know you will turn the simile against the modes of production. The clouds work east across the bay, the tongue matting the bear's fur until it looks like it has emerged from fishing for the salmon it hopes will return to Tamil Pius Creek. Any day now they'll come and I kiss you while you sleep, but not in an obvious way. Steam rises from white tea as you mix a can of paint with one chopstick. Acrylic flecks slip on the floor beside you. And why bother cleaning them, you always say. Why not give the constellation a name, a moon, a mythology? I wonder what you will paint us into as the streetlights shine down on the tent city across I-80. The rain letting up and the clouds parting, the night swelling with AM radio and umbrage as Saturn's rings slip out of focus and the telescope I found by the tracks and swore I'd finally fixed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read one more poem. Um, it's the, the last poem, the last poem in the book. Uh, it's called, I Ask My Sister's Ghost to Write Her Own Elegy. And it's the first time I'm, I'm reading this one. It's one actually, um, yeah, David, who's here, encouraged, encouraged me to write a couple more of these. And, um, and I'm really, really glad that I did. Uh, and with that, I just also just seen so many people who have been so influential to, to my writing. Um, thank you all so much for, for coming and 
uh, supporting me. I asked my sister's ghost to write her own elegy since the attempts I've made fall short. She leads me to the creek where she spent her last years testing toxins for the state. The place is nothing special, a slash between two developments, a Twinkie wrapper, cigarette butts embedded in the bank. That's how nature in the city is. The allure emerges only after many visits, flora noticed by a patient eye. You're doing it again, she interrupts, describing the land instead of me. She points toward the water. In the shallows, a crayfish pretends to be a stone. Then what should I tell people, I ask. Most days, she says, she just waded in. Let the crayfish crawl over my feet. She knew them like she knew lover scars, their cleft claws, their ridged antenna. When the crayfish population quartered, she told the council it was a settlement from their new construction. Say my death was not an act of violence. Removing a human mind, a mouth to feed, she says, is a kind of generosity. I wade up to my knees. I want to feel something crawl across my feet. An aluminum lid floats past. My little rafts, my paper lantern. There is only one dam between us and the coast. There are the soy fields and almond groves leaching nitrous clouds into the river. I hope there is an entrance to the cold thrashing sea. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna just spend a couple minutes just uh, talking with um, Eduardo and I, and then if you have, if anybody has questions or anything, you can go ahead and put them in the, in the track in the chat, excuse me, and um, and then Peter will facilitate a couple of um, a couple of those questions be before we wrap up. Thank you, Ben. That was a powerful, and moving reading. Uh, that was. Such a pleasure to be here and to uh, share the space with you tonight. So thank you again. Uh, so this, you know, we're here to, you know, celebrate your debut. And I always love to ask poets, like, tell me about the phone call, or like, was it? A hope, I hope it was a phone call, not an email, or maybe it was an email telling you about the book being picked up. Yeah, it, it was. It was a, a phone call. Um, actually, it was a was a voicemail, and um, <laughs> and it was yeah. I, I, I'm surprised that my voicemail wasn't full. I think Lauren and I are chronically, <laughs> our voicemails are, are always full. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a, definitely a, a wonderful moment. I think for this particular book, I, I didn't think that I was writing a book. I was just writing poems yeah. because I was, I felt really moved to do so. And I think Ruth who's here, um, who's been really my, my biggest teacher and the person if this book would not exist without Ruth, um, at a certain point, I think we got to talking and, and I think she maybe said, you, you probably have enough poems for a book. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, you know, eventually it just sort of became a process of, of trying to, trying to think about that. And I mean, one thing Eduardo that I, I loved hearing you get to talk about a little bit was thinking about how to order the poems in the book to kind of make, to make those come together. And I was wondering if, if maybe you could share a little bit about just the insights that you have around that. I, th I know there are a lot of other, a lot of other poets here that would also enjoy just hearing you talk about that. Eduardo and I got to be at Sewanee together recently, which was the biggest treat just to get to share space with him and so many other great, great folks. The first um, in-person event in a while, right? And just before the Delta variant uh, showed its face around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully just before. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, it, I don't know, Eduardo, if there's any about. Any book about your book order? That? Book order? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, when I was working on my first book, uh, Slow Lightning, uh, and when I got picked up for the contest, uh, one of the first things Carl Phillips told me that my, that my title was off and my order was atrocious. 
Uh, well, thanks a lot, Carl. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I intuited that, so I didn't. I wasn't really kind of uh, mad. But I was doing what many poets tend to do in the first or thesis manuscripts. I was blocking father poems here, border poems there, ephrastic poems there, surreal poems there. And Carl said, you should be braiding instead of blocking. And I said to myself, yes, but how do I do that? <laughs> so writers need to write through their problems, not think through their problems. So I got to jotting down ideas and something came to me. For each poem in uh, the first and second book, I gave each poem three or four markers. Father poem, queer poem, desert poem, sonnet. So each poem became more about one thing, all right? And like a poem can cast many shadows. And I was not seeing that, all right? I was not seeing that. When I realized that a poem, cast, a poem can cast many shadows, the uh, poems themselves became more elastic, more malleable, I had more things to work with, and it became easier to order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have, of course, the, the astonishing detail of attentiveness to language, but I'm also uh, curious about what nourished, encouraged your attentiveness to the world? Yeah, I think a lot of the poems in this book, I, I, I didn't do like a formal program in poetry. I've never, this one was like the most formal kind of writing thing that I've done. Um, <laughs> that sweaty mosquito bitten week let's see exactly they yeah. <laughs> um, sounds like mine yeah <laughs> yeah and, and i think a lot of the a lot of the poems i first wrote um through meditating like when i i always go for for like periods of 10 days uh for vipassana meditation i see i see pancho here who's it who's a big inspiration for me uh as a, as a meditator um and i think a lot of times i would just once my mind kind of quieted down enough the beginnings of a poem would start and you know you're not supposed to write anything down or talk when you're there um, and so you just kind of let them sit in your mind and kind of let them develop um, yeah. but I think that practice and just sort of that way of trying to be engaging in the world and and that attentiveness and care for what's in front of you and and trying to be present with hard things and be present with um be present with with whatever you're faced with and 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 trying to be equanimous with that I think has really informed a lot of a lot of why I'm interested in poetry and why poetry is it is a practice that I want to keep coming back to because I do think it's very connected to to meditation in the sense that it's it's so much about noticing it's so much about care and like the 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 joy for me of revising a poem is just really like looking at it over and over and and, and sort of seeing its textures and seeing where where it can can um, how it might change and unlock. Um, and that's just something that I, I, I think is, is, is so, so connected to the whole practice of meditation. I, I'm too angry to meditate, but uh, one, of my, one of my first teachers, Alberto Rios, uh, once said to me when I was an undergrad that when, when something loud happens, you know, people look toward the noise. It's the task of a poet to look away from where everybody else is looking, right? Mm -hmm. And I, that was kind of stayed with me. Oh, and I also yeah. kind of adopted it. Well, that means if I'm looking away, I'm looking, if I'm looking this other way, I should also maybe do a little 360 little dance and see around what is look all around me, right? So uh, that, cool. that, you know, that's where my attentiveness kind of took root right, as I moved through the world, paying attention to everything, right? Yeah. yeah. Even that's not just the beautiful or the sublime or what's dazzling, right? Or what's gorgeous or handsome, but uh, the things that are overlooked, the things that bewilder you, confuse you, disgust you, right? I've trained myself anytime something pauses me in the world, I sometimes don't even know why that caught my attention, right? It goes into the notebook. Mm -hmm. It goes into the notebook. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Peter, I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock. Do, do we want to maybe transition mm -hmm. into to taking some, some of the questions from the, um, from the audience? Yeah, and, sure. And, then... and we've, got, we've got quite a few here. Um, Nakachi asks, and for you both, how would you define or name the role of place in your poems? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first on that one, Eduardo? Well, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Southern Arizona, the Sonoran Desert. So the desert is my home landscape. Um, and it's, 
is visible, very visible in the first, my first two books. Uh, but what landscape gave me was uh, the kind of insight into what seems beautiful and nourishing on the surface has possibly another story. For me, that's the story, you know, the Sonoran Desert is gorgeous. Yes, it's dry and hot, but it's a very gorgeous landscape. But because I'm the son of Mexican immigrants, I know what goes on in that landscape, right? Uh, human smuggling, um, um, deaths, right? People making a way through this country to survive, to blossom here, right? So I, I grew up aware that the desert is both a beautiful thing and a dangerous thing, all right, all right? And from that, I was able to have that kind of duality or uh, resonance of the landscape and I just apply it to everything, to even language, right, right? I'm not a poet who, who's in, in, in love with language. I, yes, I do love it here and there, but I also mistrust it, right? I, I'm also bewildered by it. I'm puzzled by it, right? I have a, fu a full, I have an intimacy with the language, like intimacy with somebody that ebbs and flows, right? Highs and lows, right? And that I think is rooted from my attentiveness to what the landscape really is for me. If that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I really, I was really resonating with what you said as well about the connection between language and place. And I think so many of the words that I find most interesting are kind of specifics to place, um, or or just thinking about like a getting getting kind of peeling back, like wanting. One of the things I love about writing a poem is it. it it makes you want to go and, and be more specific about like what's around you. Um, and I yeah. think that, that that really that has really helped me to to know my surroundings better and to try to to try to just have a practice of oh like what kind, you know, not just like that sage, but like what kind of sage. And then there's often some interesting, interesting words or interesting language in there. Very um, good. um and I think also, I mean, I'm also interested in I I think increasingly so many of the places that we're writing about are, are interrupted by you know like the only experiences of beauty that we have are are also kind of interrupted spaces by with industry and, and city and um i i think that's just a an endlessly fascinating kind of situation that we find ourselves in and I, I think a lot of the poems that i that i write are kind of found in these little places that there's like a little patch of green you know next the 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 wetland bisected by the freeway and just what how we are all still trying to find beauty and still trying to find connection in spite of the situation that we find ourselves in with the climate and how can we do that and what role does poetry have in, in bringing that forward and helping people to to still have an open heart and, and look for those things is something that I'm also I'm almost yeah. really interested in yeah but, but as Gabriel notes in your her introduction to your to your book I mean one thing that makes your work really kind of charge is that the beautiful and the terrifying coexist right yeah i've got to mention you know there's a lot of love coming your way in the chat i'm going to save that chat for you guys uh kate comments i wonder if ben and eduardo might speak about the intersection of public and private griefs and how they balance or don't balance either in the writing or revising mm. uh, what role does imagery play in guiding you mm. Oh, so, wow, that's a great question. Yeah. So you go first, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. I, I mean, I think just having gone through that, that in that read in this reading, a public grief is such a private grief made 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 public. Um, I and I, I, you know, sometimes um, I, I, I think that, I think that that it's. I'm not sure that this exactly answers the question, but I do think it's really important that that there's a space for that, and that there's a space for a collective a collective grieving, and and there's a space for the acknowledgement of of our private griefs. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that so I'm so interested in the idea of the 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 personal and the private being relatable and and, and universal, and like just thinking about all of us have experienced loss, and so I guess I almost wonder if if um if those if it's sort of a maybe a false dichotomy like I, I i know that i know that they're they're not different but i mean i know that they are different but i i i wonder i wonder about maybe they're cordoned off in ways that they they don't need to be 
um, or that we kind of have a, a way of, of not wanting to be vulnerable or, or not wanting to have a, a, a public grief. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I agree, agree with everything I'm saying. It's, it's just sort of very off the, off the cuff of, of what I'm thinking about, just being right now in that moment of, of, of sharing. Um, so, yeah, for me, uh, and for the distinction for me, my private griefs, my private mourning, they're untranslatable, right? Uh, it leads to silence. I, I'm surrounded, infused by silence, nothingness, when I'm, when I'm grieving privately behind closed doors. Uh, when eventually that grief finds its way to language, uh, then I could open the door and walk into the world again with the grief on my sleeve, right? But for me, it has to be private for how, no matter how, for days, weeks, years, right? I just live in that non-language of grief, the untranslatable emotions. And then um, a word or, or something leads me out into language, into the world again. Yeah. I, I just saw Ruth put something here in the chat uh, for Adrian Rich, uh, Adrian Rich's words are coming to mind. The pain in the body is not the same as the pain in the streets, but you can learn from the edges that blur. Oh, you who love clean edges more than anything, watch the edges that blur. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. It's such a pleasure to, to have you here too, Ruth. Thank you. And Ricardo comments um, regarding meditation and silence. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about your relationship to the unspoken or the unsayable? How do you approach a retreat or move from there in your poems? Mm, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Ricardo. And Ricardo, thank you for the balloon as well. Oh, um, that he's the one that's <laughs> Dr. Balloon. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's so interesting. I, the, way, the way I want to answer that question is that Silence allows us to see what we haven't been able or what we haven't been able to say. Like for me, it's once you really get quiet, you kind of understand the things that the things that are meant to be said kind of come up or or um, you get to a place where the subconscious takes over or that there's there's less conscious mind. And I think that thinning out that barrier between the conscious and the subconscious through a prep for, for me that through a practice of, of meditation um, that is where a lot of the images or things that are unspeakable become spoken because I they're down here and I'm trying to make a space where they can come up and and then I try to look at them in a poem and and, and see if that can if, if I can make sense of them myself or, or sort of structure them in, in a more ordinary kind of reality I don't know if that makes sense but that's a, a lot of my process in terms of where where the origin of a poem comes from or, or what I'm hoping to, to get at, what, what are the things that I'm, I'm not allowing myself to acknowledge about myself or the things that I'm not allowing myself to acknowledge about the, the, the broader world. Um, sometimes that stuff will come up in, in when I'm more in that quiet space. Yeah. I mean, an elegy, a poem about the moon, a poem about a puppy, a poem about desire, a poem about your, your parents. I mean, they're... they're they're made of language, words, right? And language never equals experience, memory. Just think of the word heartache. It can never it, get close to what heartache feels like. Desire, say the word mother. That word mother doesn't even get close to what mother might mean to us, right? So at the end of the day, every poem is a failed attempt, right? But in that, in, but in that space of an accessibility, there is, a, you get close enough, you approximate. And that suffices for me. I find freedom and nourishment in knowing that my words will not equal what I've experienced and felt. But my task as a poet to get mm -hmm. as close as possible as I can with my language and my skills. Yeah. Yeah. I was just one thing that Mark Mark Jarman we just had a chance to study with him at Sewanee. He he was saying that part of the power of a metaphor is where it fails, like when where it kind of comes where it kind of falls short. And I just thought that that was a really beautiful idea. Is that sometimes the strength of a metaphor is, is how it can't quite reach what it's 
trying to get at and then exactly with the metaphors like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's Metaphor. too perfect you, yeah. you failed yeah. um somehow i thought that was yeah that was really wonderful yeah, um, yeah. I love those moments too when I when I'm reading a metaphor, I take the leap that the metaphor is uh, asking me to take, and then mid-air, I'm as a reader, I'm like, wait, where am I going to land? <laughs> I've just been pushed into the air, and I'm not where I'm not sure where I'm going to land or like where I'm going to land. But I, that's one of the thrills of reading metaphor for me. Yeah. So I maybe do we can next thing by do metaphors. Yeah. That's my that's my extreme sporting. <laughs> and what I was thinking, maybe we could close by each just reading reading one more poem if that's okay yeah. and, and uh, get everybody out of here right on time. And, um... So considerate. Thank you, Ben, again, for inviting me to share this night, this special night and uh, congratulations on your first book. How amazing is that? Now I'll start working on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just end by reading a short poem from the second book. Uh, uh, questions for my body. I'm at that age where I actually have to take my glasses off to really, really read the small poems, right? Questions for my body. Why are you nocturnal? How many cathedrals have you entered? Has cruelty ever saved you? Do you remember the length of his thumbs? Isn't that enough cake? Have you ever soaked your feet in gasoline, do you still fear the virus? How can you sleep in this heat? Is that a soul patch? Did you laugh or cry at Keith's grave? Have you been claimed? Mm. Oh my God, my voice broke like Peter Brady at the end there. I love that poem so much, Eduardo. That's Thank you, ben. definitely one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to go out on a, a little bit of a lighter note um and i think i don't know, i think one of the interesting things about about putting together a book is is sort of the, diff the different range of sort of tone or 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 space that it can occupy and and um so i i thought it might be nice just to just to go out on a little bit of a lighter note um with a poem here called outside tallahassee at the base of a waterfall, a boy offers to sell me his chameleon, and I ask if I can pay for it in stars. Mist leaps off the rocks. The night is warm, and the spray emboldens me. How about those two, the twins, I say, pointing toward Castor and Pollux, clinking like silver coins in the southern sky. Make it the little dipper, he insists. So I reach to bend down the little dipper and the three of us pretend to drink the thin piquant cosmos. When the ladle empties, he tucks the constellation in his back pocket like a slingshot and retreats down the hillside. In the moon dark, my chameleon's sharp toes grip my skin as he climbs my limbs. The astral sheen on his lips gleaming like the astral sheen on mine. So yeah, thank you all so, so much for, for coming. Um, it's truly so many of my, my most beloved people. Uh, I love you so much. And Eduardo, truly thank you. Your poems have meant so much to me and, and, and to so many. And I, I really appreciate you and, and sharing time and space. And, and Peter, thank you so much for, for having us here. It's really, really kind of you. And a special shout out to Peter and all the people at um, City Lights. They're working so hard to make space for, for for authors that to be able to do events like this in the midst of the pandemic, which is is so kind of you. So so thank you for that. Thank you for those kind words, Ben. Congratulations, Eduardo. That was amazing. Um, it doesn't get any better than this on Zoom, I think. It's an honor. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Be well. Be safe.